Brandon Lee was an American actor and martial artist. Lee made a name for himself with his martial arts and acting skills. He was widely regarded as a rising action film star in the early 90s. However, he was more popularly known as the son of world famous martial arts and movie star Bruce Lee, who died in 1973, allegedly as a result of a bad reaction to a headache tablet. In 1993, Brandon Lee was in Wilmington, North Carolina, on the set of a movie he was filming titled The Crow. Lee was playing the lead role of Eric Draven. On March March 31st, 1993, while shooting a scene which involved his character in the film being shot and killed, the cameras were rolling as Lee's fellow actor in the film, Michael Massey, opened fire using the specially made handgun for the film. After he pulled the trigger and shot Lee, he fell backwards instead of forwards like he was supposed to. When the director yelled, cut, Lee did not stand up. Many of the cast and crew thought he was either still acting or kidding around. Fellow martial arts stuntman Jeff Amata immediately checked Lee and noticed something was wrong when he came close. Brandon Lee was unconscious and breathing heavily. He was rushed to a nearby hospital and after unsuccessful attempts to save him in six hours of emergency surgery, Brandon Lee was pronounced dead on March 31st, 1993 at 1.03pm. He was 28 years old. Six weeks earlier, the crew of the film were preparing to shoot a pawn shop scene for the movie. They visited a local pawn shop and borrowed hundreds of items for the shoot, one of which was a box of 44 Magnum bullets. With the pawn shop set built and the setup nearing completion, the box of live ammunition was placed on the fictional pawn shop counter. The stunt coordinator found the live ammunition and was livid. He knew that the bottom Bottom line when it came to film sets is live ammunition is never supposed to be present on set. The stunt coordinator then locked the bullets in his car, where they remained for another two weeks. On the set of The Crow, preparations began for a scene that required quarter load blank bullets. Instead of purchasing the correct blanks, the live shells from the stunt coordinator's car were used to be modified into blanks. The lead tip of the live shells was removed with a pair of pliers and the gunpowder inside was also shook out, leaving the cartridge and the primer. The end result was about a handful of empty casings, each with a live primer. While making the quarter load blank bullets, they also began making dummy bullets. These are bullets with no gunpowder or primer, just the bullet casing and the lead tip. They cannot be fired. The primers were then fired off from the blank bullets that had been made. They then took the empty casings and put lead tips back in the casings to make them into sets of dummy rounds. However, the primers of the bullets were not checked to have all been fired when the dummy rounds were made, meaning that some bullets were mixed up and at least one dummy round still had a primer intact. The film soon after required a shot which depicted looking down the barrel of a gun. The trigger was pulled, rotating one cylinder or round to simulate someone firing the gun. At least two people on set near the gun heard a popping sound coming from the weapon. Nobody realized it was the sound of a primer firing. It had exploded with just enough force to dislodge the lead tip from the bullet casing and wedge it into the gun barrel. It remained in the gun barrel for another 14 days. Two weeks later on March 31st, 1993, the gun chamber was fully loaded with blanks in preparation for the death scene of Brandon Lee's character in The Crow. With the lead tip still lodged in the barrel and the cameras rolling, Actor Michael Massey fired the gun at Brandon Lee. The force was the equivalent of a live 44 handgun round. During the production for The Crow, a gun expert was never called upon on set. Due to the chain of negligence involving so many people, nobody was ever likely to be convicted and no criminal charges were filed. In Brandon's father Bruce Lee's final film, Lee's character in the film is shot with a prop gun, which in the story is secretly made to fire a real bullet and kill him. Sonia Davis was an American stunt woman who worked on 15 productions from 1992 through to 1994. She worked as a stunt double for Whoopi Goldberg, Janet Jackson, and many more actors. She was also one of few African American stunt women in Hollywood. On the 2nd of November 1994, Davis was working as the acting stunt double for Angela Bassett on the film Vampire in Brooklyn and was performing a stunt which required her to fall 42 feet from a rooftop of a building backwards. Davis's mother and brother were on set to witness her carry out the stunt. This was supposed to be a routine fall onto an airbag that was placed in an alleyway between two buildings. According to witnesses, before carrying out the stunt, Davis yelled to the stunt coordinator, are you sure, before deciding to carry out the stunt. Davis fell backwards, 
bounced off the airbag, slammed into the wall of one of the nearby buildings, and then onto the ground below. Davis was in a coma for two weeks following the accident, and eventually died from her injuries on November 14, 1994. Sonia Davis was 32. In an account of events from the film cinematographer Mark Irwin, he explains his story of the events that took place. The space between the buildings was 12 feet across, and the airbag was also 12 feet. The airbag was as big as a house. It filled the alley entirely. That's why there was no ambulance on set, because the airbag was so big. There was no way she could miss it unless she did the stunt wrong. She had done all the moves. She was aware of the scene. Davis's mother, Wanda Sapp, recounted what happened by saying, The last words I heard my baby say was when she yelled down to the stunt coordinator, are you sure? I could feel Sonia wasn't comfortable with the stunt. The film cinematographer Mark Irwin continues his recount of what took place by saying, Leading up to the fall, she was hanging on the side of the building, or it was supposed to look like that. We had something underneath her. Before she fell, the stunt coordinator said, Don't push off. Just relax and fall back naturally. Well, she didn't relax. She pushed so hard her head hit the opposing brick wall, and when she fell, only the tips of her toes touched the airbag. The rest of her body hit the pavement. She landed at my feet. Sonia Davis's friend and fellow stuntwoman Denise Roberts stated in a 1996 interview, stunt performers are often branded as unreliable if they back out of a setup they aren't sure about. Sonia Davis had previously been removed from a job on the film Strange Days after having difficulty with a particular car sequence. Denise Roberts recalled Davis talking about the experience by saying, no one else will ever do that to me again. Arthur Everett Scholl, more commonly known by Art Scholl, was an American aerobatic pilot and aerial cameraman who was known for having worked in over 50 film productions, many of which involved stunt flights. On the 16th of September 1985, Scholl was flying his Pitts S2 camera plane in order to record flight maneuver footage for the film Top Gun. Whilst in flight, Scholl intentionally entered a flight maneuver known as a flat spin while the onboard cameras were recording. Scholl successfully began the flat spin maneuver, but he was unable to pull up and return to regular flight. Observers on the ground saw the plane continue to keep on spinning as it descended past the planned recovery altitude. The plane then soon after plunged into the Pacific Ocean. The exact cause of the crash was never confirmed and neither the aircraft nor Scholl's body were ever recovered. Art Scholl was 53. A spotter plane arrived at the scene 45 seconds after the crash and reported seeing no signs of life, despite of course not seeing the actual impact of the crash. Rescue aircraft and vessels recovered only some floating debris from the plane. It was speculated the aircraft with Scholl inside sank to a depth of over 900 feet about 5 miles off Encinitas, California. The Coast Guard continued to search the 25 square mile area near the crash with the assistance of a helicopter and a patrol vessel. The search was later called off the following morning. During a scene in the film Top Gun, the main character Maverick flies through Iceman's jet wash which causes a flame out on his F-14 Tomcat starboard Engine. His Tomcat enters a flat spin and Maverick is unable to pull out. He and another character from the film, Goose, who was also on board, are forced to eject from the plane. When attempting to gather footage for the movie, Art Scholl entered the same flat spin that is depicted in the film and was also unable to recover, crashing into the ocean. The difference in the real life tragedy being that Scholl could not eject and was never found. Another angle to this incident is that it was generally thought at the time that heavy film camera equipment affixed to a Pitts S2 plane altered its weight and balance envelope, making recovery from a flat spin just about impossible. At the end of the Top Gun credits, text appears stating the film is dedicated to the memory of Art Scholl. He was widely regarded at the time of his death as the last of three top Hollywood stunt pilots. Scholl's last words heard over the radio were, I have a problem. I have a real problem. Anthony Dwayne Lee was an American actor and playwright whose biggest film and TV acting credits included roles in Liar Liar and appearances on ER and NYPD Blue. On October 28th, 2000, Lee was attending a Halloween party at a friend's mansion popularly known as The Castle. At some time around 1am, officers Terrell Hopper and Natalie Humphreys responded to a noise complaint coming from the party. Both officers arrived at the party and met a private security guard who was hired by one of the party's hosts. The security guard led both officers 
witnesses to the kitchen and left them to find the host of the party. Elsewhere in the castle was Anthony Lee as well as his friend, fellow actor Jeff Denton. Another unidentified actor was also in a bedroom of the house chatting with Lee and Denton. Meanwhile, Officer Hopper decided to leave the kitchen, exiting through a side door. He then searched the darkened, narrow path behind the home with his flashlight before reaching the glass door of the bedroom Lee and his friends were in. Anthony Lee and Jeff Denton then saw Officer Hopper's flashlight shine through the glass door onto them at the same time Lee was playing with his replica 357 Magnum Desert Eagle handgun made of rubber. This was meant to be part of his Halloween costume and the character he was meant to be. Officer Hopper allegedly saw the handgun pointing toward him and mistook Lee's rubber prop gun for a real handgun. He began to open fire through the glass door nine times, hitting Anthony Lee a total of four times, once in the head and three times in the back, killing him. Anthony Dwayne Lee was 39. The police chief at the time defended Officer Terrell Hopper and called the entire incident an accident. He maintained that Lee pointed a very realistic replica gun at Officer Hopper and that's why he opened fire, but the LAPD was soon after accused of using improper force and withholding facts about the entry wounds when an autopsy revealed the extent of Lee's fatal injuries. The lawsuit filed by Anthony Lee's sister, his only remaining immediate family, never came to trial because the security security guards working at the party, the key witnesses, couldn't be found by the trial date. The case was settled out of court in Anthony Lee's sister's favour. A year later, in October 2001, the LAPD Internal Review Board revealed that Officer Terrell Hopper's actions were justifiable and he was in policy using deadly force. According to LAPD officials, the board also recommended that Officer Hopper seek additional training to improve his tactics. A slightly questionable source in terms of its credibility comes from the testimony of Anthony Anthony Lee's friend Raymond McLean. McLean was supposedly with Lee on the day leading up to the shooting, however did not attend the party, nor was he in the room when Lee was shot. He claimed in a written statement of the events from his perspective, the other witnesses in the room refuted the story of the officer. The LAPD took them to the station and kept them there all night, asking them over and over to tell the story, hoping to get a different story. The next morning, the LAPD called the house and said they needed to take out the wall where the rest of the bullets were for evidence. The owner of the home, a friend of Anthony's, told them no and got a lawyer. The officer shot through a small window in the door while standing behind a cement wall and claimed self-defense. No one actually heard the shots or saw the officer because they came from outside. Anthony hit the floor and at first people thought he was joking. He was on his back. He was confused. He looked up at one of his friends like, what's up? And died. He never knew he was shot. John Eric Hexum was an American actor and model known for his starring roles in hit early 80s TV series Voyages and Cover Up. On October 12, 1984, Hexum and his fellow cast and crew on the TV series Cover Up were filming the show's seventh episode, Golden Opportunity, on stage 18 of the 20th Century Fox lot. A scene set to be filmed that day depicted Hexum's character loading cartridges into a 44 Magnum handgun. Hexum had been provided with a functional gun and blank bullets. When the scene didn't work, out in the way the show's director had envisioned for the master shot, there was a delay in filming. During this delay in shooting, a bored and tired Hexum began playing around with the gun while sitting on a bed in the set. He loaded the gun with one blank bullet and playfully spun the chamber around in a Russian roulette style. He then put the gun directly up to his temple and pulled the trigger. The power and force of the gun penetrated Hexum's skull and lodged a big piece of it into his brain. John Eric Hexum died in the hospital six days later. The machine machines keeping him alive were turned off after he was declared brain dead. He was 26 years old at the time of his death. The closest witness to Hexum's death was Frank Lau, a draper installer for the film industry on the cover-up set that day. In an interview about the accidental death, he said, John Eric Hexum happened to be lying on the bed and was apparently, as I recall, loading and then unloading a revolver. They took a break in shooting and he remained seated on the bed. They had closed the door. I was just outside for a few moments when there was a loud bang. Lau then rushed into the room to discover Hexum lying across the bed. Blank bullets usually have a small piece of paper wadding where the lead bullet tip would usually go if it were a real bullet. The load of gunpowder in blanks is varied depending on how much flash needs to be visible when a blank is fired. It is unknown how much gunpowder was in the blank when Hexum fired it. The paper wadding 
thing that Hexum fired from the gun did not penetrate his skull. However, the explosive effect of the muzzle blast caused enough blunt force trauma to fracture a quarter sized piece of his skull and propel it into his brain, causing massive hemorrhaging. With his mother's permission, his body was flown to San Francisco on life support, where his heart was transplanted into a 36 year old Las Vegas man and one of his kidneys went to a critically ill 5 year old boy. Skin that was donated was used to treat a 3.5 year old boy with third degree burns. Another one of his kidneys and his corneas were also donated. John Eric Hexham's co-star on cover up, Jennifer O'Neill, recounts visiting him in the hospital in the days he was there. I just looked at him laying there on machines. I couldn't visibly see anything wrong with him. He looked just perfect. Like, get up. Wake up. Mark Akerstream was a Canadian actor and stuntman best known for his role as Tony in the Jackie Chan film Rumble in the Bronx. Akerstream would amass more than 70 credits as a stuntman for films and TV shows throughout his career. On August 15th, 1998, Akerstream was doing stunt work for a TV series called The Crow, Stairway to Heaven, when an unlikely freak pyrotechnics accident occurred. In a scene that required a rowboat to explode, Akerstream was a spectating bystander and was not involved in the preparation of the explosion. When the film crew gave the all clear for the detonation, the rowboat exploded as planned. However, a piece of debris from the rowboat shot up into the air, cleared a large tree, and fell down to strike Akerstream on the head, killing him. Production for The Crow, Stairway to Heaven was immediately suspended. When the accident occurred, the show was six episodes into filming of an eventual 22 for what ended up being the show's only season. This accident had nothing to do with the reasons for the show's cancellation. One of the show's production companies, Crescent Entertainment, stated that they extend their deepest sympathy and condolences to his family. Akerstream was 44. All our times have 